Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. To everybody that's here, not many of us, just a few, including the team. I believe there's somebody popping their head in, coming to say hello. We want to welcome you and welcome to the service online. Uh, thank you for joining us. I um, hope that you found it relatively easy. Um, just to give you a little bit of news, so um, we're going to be trying to go on, online to Facebook next week. Um, as well as YouTube at the same time. Um, we're also sending podcasts, so um, have a look for Rissefeld Park Baptist Church, um, or RPBC, sorry, on podcasts. We'll send you the link, and it'll, go, it'll circulate via WhatsApp, and then within the next few hours, uh, we'll be creating a church WhatsApp group where administration can uh, communicate with you any announcements. Um, if you have any prayer requests, um, please let us know. We've got an email address. It's at the beginning of the, um, of the service on the countdown. Um, as well as if you have any comments or any questions, um, you're more than welcome to communicate with us over WhatsApp and on email. So I'd like you just to grab the family next to you, um, your family, not the next family, your family. Um, hold their hands and we're just going to lift you up in prayer and ask for God's protection and His, and His blood to cover you this, this morning. Father God, we just want to worship you, give you all the glory, and we want to thank you for sending your son down to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord God, we just want to lift our hands and, and sing and shout that our God is a great God. And we worship you this morning. We ask that you come into this house, come into this place, come into our homes, but most of all, come into our hearts. So that as we hear a word from you, Lord Jesus, that you would speak into the heart that is hard and make it of flesh. And Lord God, as the psalmist says, we will sing unto you a new song. And today we sing to you a new song. And worship and declare that our God is a great God. We pray your protection upon your people. And those that desperately need you in this time. Father God, step in and intervene. And hold your people up high. In Jesus' holy and precious name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Why not you stand with us? We're going to worship in your homes, in this place. We're going to get some worship in.
amazing grace. This is amazing grace. The king of my heart be the man 
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Each one of us just quieten our hearts in your presence, allowing the separation between each other not become a literal thing, but spiritual. That we would just separate ourselves from the, the demands of life, the expectations that are upon us, and let us just quieten our hearts in your presence as we come closer to you Lord give me the strength Lord and the ability to convey a message that I believe is from you allow me to speak it in truth allow me to speak the words as if it were from the very mouth of God Father I'm so aware of how frail I am as a human being when it comes to holy ground as this. But I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you so much for the opportunity to share life with your people. I stand in the, foot, in the, in the footsteps or in the shoes of Peter when he said to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, you have the words of truth and the words of life. And so I pray, Lord, that as I speak, those words would come alive in the hearts of your people and that your name Lord Jesus is glorified Holy Spirit move amongst the hearts of your people wherever we are and allow your word just to enter in into homes where people are battling with relationships where where there's heartache where there's brokenness let your word just penetrate through those barriers and bring life and light into the, those places, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, you may be seated or you may get your cup of coffee. Wherever you are, I assume you're at home. 
I'll continue speaking on Daniel chapter 6. Well, Daniel, I'm in chapter 6 at the moment. And I've really enjoyed Daniel very much. And he's expressed so much of what we need in our daily lives and in the world that we're facing today. Daniel chapter 6 is quite a famous chapter discussing Daniel as he is thrown into the lion's den. And... um, If you have children and they go to Sunday school, they will soon learn about Daniel and the lion's den. But friends, as I was speaking to my wife, well, this week regarding this text, the lion's den is not the major point in this particular chapter. The lion's den is just secondary. The most important point here are the lions around, the people that come to Daniel's life and to disturb his peace and his integrity. And so what I'd like us to do is to make, it's a very long chapter, but what I'd like us to do is look at verses 25 to the end of the chapter, because things have changed in the actual story of Daniel. You will notice that when Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar in the very beginning, in chapter 2, Daniel revealed or interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he told Nebuchadnezzar that God was trying to tell him that he will not reign for a very long time, or as he thought, forever. That this statue that he he dreamt about, this man image, the top half, the head and shoulders were made of gold, and the the shoulders down to the chest were silver. Then you got the the midsection, which was bronze, and then the, the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. The story has now moved where the head and shoulders of gold have been destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar and his reign and Babylon's reign and empire had been destroyed. And now the Medo-Persians have taken over, which is Darius and Cyrus have taken over. And chapter 6 starts with that. A prophecy in its, in its process being foretold and come to come and not come into completion, but becoming real. And friends, if that has already happened, the rest of this image has taken place as we sit in our seats at home or in our beds, wherever you may be, that prophecy has taken place. Because the, uh, the image of iron and clay are the Romans. And we have passed the Roman rule already when Jesus Christ came to this planet. And so friends, as I said to a gentleman in a shop yesterday, as he owned this shop and he was, I sort of developed a friendship over, with him over the years and I said to him, how's things going? And he said to me, look, it's tough. And I said to him, well, this is a time where you need to consider that God is saying something to each one of us. And I say this with sincerity. God is speaking to the church. And the church needs to go out and share the gospel with as many people as you can. Because God is saying, prepare your hearts for I'm coming. I'm coming sooner than what you can imagine. And so, just to come back to the story. God is saying to Darius and he's saying to Daniel, prepare my people. Because after chapter 6, Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, it's hard when you've got false teeth. <laughs> that when chapter 7 starts, Daniel start, starts speaking to the nation of Israel. From chapters 1 to 6, Daniel is speaking to a pagan, all the pagan nations. From 7 to the end of, cha- of, of Daniel, Daniel speaks to the people of Israel. And so we're getting the last part of Daniel speaking to a pagan king. But look at, listen to what the king says about Daniel. And I want to challenge us this morning to ask you, are people saying this about us? That is the question I want to ask you today. Are people saying this about us? As the king looks at Daniel, verse 24. He says, then, the, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. 
That's every king's desire. That people prosper greatly. And then he says in verse 26, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Wonderful words from a pagan king as he looks at Daniel and he says to the peoples, you need to fear and reverence God, the God of Daniel. My question to us this morning, when people look at us, do they say we must reverence and fear the God of the Bible that you worship? Listen to how he explains this God. Daniel keeps quiet because it's coming from the, within this, this king's heart, this desire to express the inexpressible. How do you put words into context and explain God? The heavens declare the glory of God. It speaks forth His glory. But yeah, a man, a pagan man, says, for He is live, he's a living God. He's the living God. And He endures forever. In other words, He's eternal. His kingdom will never be destroyed. And it's interesting to note that at this point Daniel has, has been under the rule of four kings. Some people will say, but there's only three. Nebuchadnezzar was the other king that's never mentioned. That was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Daniel's been there for four kings. Three of them have gone. Two of them are still there. But Daniel still remains. Interesting point for you and I to remember. The Bible tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail against God's kingdom. The church will still stand. Listen to me carefully. The church will still stand when the world seems to fall into chaos God will, God's word will still remain. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And then he does the most wonderful thing. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So part of this prophecy at this point in time is taking place. Babylon has been destroyed, that head, and now it's the, it's the, the silver area of, the, of the, the various kingdoms and empires that rule over nations. And friends, the, just for your own information, Alexander the Great was regarded the bronze part of that particular uh, statue. He's come and gone. And then the Romans come into, into play. And they've come and gone. And so we're living by grace. But as I go into this text, I want you to note the heading of my message, Yeah, I stand. Daniel says, Yeah, I stand. I took this, this particular heading from a very famous man. If it wasn't for a great part of his life, we wouldn't have a religion that we do have today. Well, I don't believe all that. I would say that God would have used some other sort of form to change things at the moment. But this man was accused of heresy. He was threatened with excommunication and, de and the death sentence was hanging over his head. This man is Martin Luther, who stood resolute in front of the Pope and said, Yeah, I stand. I can do no other, so help me God. His conscience and scripture bore witness to this determined no, no recanting stance against the medieval church of his day, which had become corrupt and had become difficult to identify a good man when you saw one. You see, Daniel could say, Here I stand in the midst of the vicious lions and know God's peace and protection. His greatest threat 
was outside the den, not inside the den. So what I want to do this morning, I want to explain to you what I mean, because the den of lions is just an expression, an outward expression of what God does to us. But I want to say this to you this morning, friends. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego also faced their fiery furnace. And I can guarantee you now, since the last time I preached that message, each one of us has faced a fiery furnace, or is about to face a fiery furnace, or is in the midst of a fiery furnace. And I ask you, there was something said quite a few weeks ago when I mentioned this text of the fiery furnace, that as, as the three boys stood in front of this fiery furnace, they could never, they could, they could never see God in the, in the furnace until they stood in the fire. Outside of the fire, they could just see this, 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 this wild fire going. And they thought to themselves, we still trust in God. He will rescue us, but if not, we will still worship Him. And I hope that you can say that. But when they stepped into the fire, He stepped in with them. And that's such an encouragement for me as we face in our fiery furnaces. But there are times where that fiery furnace becomes also a den of lions. Because you face many people in your life who want to devour you. And you need to know how to stand in the promises of God. And Daniel was a good man. As I read this text, kings looked at him and saw something special about him. I want us to look at the first point that I would ask for you to write down and as I describe what type of man Daniel was, that he could say, here I stand. You see, today we are forced to do church in a different way. We have to go online, we have to go live, we've got to, we've got to watch uh, YouTube or Facebook to enjoy a service. But yet, Daniel tells me something different. A pagan king, a nation, are infected by his religion. He never used any form of media to express who he, be, who he believed in. He, never was, he was never handed pamphlets to say to, to, to the people out there, listen, you must read this pamphlet about John and learn about Jesus Christ or learn about God. He was never told by any form of, of religion institution, religious institution to, to go to a particular seminar to learn how to spread the gospel. He never had anything like that. But yet a king could say, everybody needs to worship Daniel's God. What made this man so special is the question. The second question is, do people speak about God when they see you? So one of the first points that we can learn from Daniel is that he was a diligent worker. He was a diligent worker. Now this affects every one of us. Let me explain to you from the text. Verses 1 to 5 of chapter 6. It pleased Darius. Now Darius was the king of the time. To appoint 120 satraps to rule over or well, throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them. In other words, the king at the time decided he's got a big empire. He can't run it by himself, so he needs to delegate people. And he delegates 120 Governors, that's what a satrap is, is a governor. And then with those governors, he, would, he said, I need three presidents to rule over that 120. That means there's 40 each that each president had to look after. And Daniel was one of them. Now listen to what the text says. With three administrators, which were the governors, over them, one of whom was Daniel. Now it's interesting to note, you would just read over that and think, well that's great. But if you put it into the historical context, 
Daniel was a foreigner in a foreign land. And people who were a king who had conquered a land would destroy anybody else that belonged to the, to the conquered uh, kingdom's uh, belongings. So whoever followed the king before and he was conquered, those people who'd, who was involved with that king would be destroyed. But yet Daniel wasn't. Daniel remained in a high position. And you've got to ask yourself why. And friends, let me put it into, into your context and mine. Sometimes when you find, especially now, with the COVID virus and companies are closing down. We are so fearful of what's going to happen to us. Are we still going to survive? And I'm talking about some people who would say, well, I don't know what my position is any longer in the company. I want you to stand in Daniel's shoes. I want to stand in Daniel's shoes. I'm talking from my own perspective here. I want to trust in God in everything that I believe in. This is where your faith is so important for you. That you need to say to yourself, if Daniel could face the threat of one king taking over his whole land and wiping out the whole of Israel and Jerusalem and then moving them into Babylon and then surviving in Babylon and then experiencing the conquering of Babylon and being taken over by the Medo-Persians and yet Daniel still remains in the palace. Someone must be involved in, in control of his life. And so I'm asking you, who's in control of your life? Who's in control of my life? And so Daniel quietly but, but firmly and courageously is following after the heart of God. And that is what I want to hold, let you hold on to this morning. Is Daniel is holding on to the heart of God. And how does he do that? Let's read. Verse 3. Now, let me go to verse 2. The satraps were made accountable to them. A very important piece of scripture. The satraps or the governors were made appointable or accountable to the presidents. So why? So that the king might not suffer loss. You see, tax is still important even in those days. Kings were still worried about what was coming in, the monies that was coming in. They did not want to lose anything as they don't want to lose anything now. And that's an important factor. And the king looks at, at, at Daniel and he appoints Daniel as a president. Hold my people accountable. Forty of them that are under your control. Now listen friends. We are living in a real world today. We're living in a world where there's corruption in high in the hierarchies of our governments and even in the lower parts in our, in our land in little companies that are struggling to work we find people who are managers that still are dealing in corruption and the bosses or the leaders of companies are looking very closely for people who they can trust and verse 3 says to me this morning as Darius chooses Daniel he does this for this reason. He does that for this reason. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. I want you to write that word down, exceptional qualities, because I'm going to share, share something with you right now. He had exceptional qualities, and you would say, oh, well, he must have been a, a, a good administrator. He was good at, 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 at admin. He was good at doing the books. But friends, I did a bit of reading. I did a bit of research. The New International Version says exceptional qualities. The New King James Version says something else. It says extraordinary spirit. It says also, an excellent spirit. The King James Version says excellent spirit. And the New American Standard says extraordinary spirit. The New International says he had 
exceptional qualities. Such a vast difference. And when I went into this thing a little bit deeper, I realized that that word exceptional spirit in the Hebrew was ruach. He had ruach. And I thought to myself, is it the same ruach as we understand it? I don't know if you know what ruach means, but it's the Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit hadn't fully fell on everybody because Jesus had, hadn't come and then lifted only kings and when I say Israeli kings, priests and um, prophets were given the Holy Spirit. But Daniel was given the Holy Spirit. Which was interesting, but the word describes breath. And there was an air around Daniel. A breath, his attitude was something special. And that's what I think the New International is trying to describe. There was something of an exceptional quality about Daniel. When you, were, when you stood in his presence, something told you that this man was different. I want to ask you, friend. When people stand around you and I, do they see something different when we speak, when we talk, and when we do things with them? You see, Daniel was diligent in everything he did. And sometimes people like that get on our nerves. When they're so pedantic over work, certain things must be put in place. You need to count every little cent and make sure that every little cent is recorded. Daniel was that type of person. But one of the things about Daniel is that he could talk to people even though he worked with excellence. Now listen to me, friend. You need to work with excellence as a, God of, as a man of God and a woman of God in the workplace that God has placed you in because people are watching and they're looking for someone that they can trust. I believe strongly that if the Spirit of God is in you, He will quickly inform you that you are doing something wrong when you are working in your workplace. Even when you are at school, as I'm looking at some of the young people this morning, not listening to teachers, and I'm talking about teachers that are teaching at home, moms, I listened to a parent this week where they said we are battling so much because of this online teaching that we've got to teach our children what, what the teachers should be teaching. And I'm thinking to myself, so what are the teachers actually doing? And that is one of the faults. If you're a Christian teacher, what are you really doing for your students? And I'm challenging you teachers to make an effort. To take the load off the parents because the, the, their load is big enough, heavy enough to put the extra load on their, on their, on their plates to educate their, their children and then still say at the end of the day, I need my salary. And so friends, I'm saying to us, as Christians, we have a role to play. And Daniel was one of those people who, who, who held people accountable. And we are meant to hold each other accountable in this world that we're living in. Because not only is it for my own good, it's to the glory of God. Because when we stand before Him, we have to give an account of what we had done. And yeah, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators because he kept them accountable. A good leader leads from the front. And then what happens? Verse 4. Verse 4 says, At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel. You see, when you are working in an exceptional manner, because you're not working towards men, or you're not, making ple or you're not pleasing men and women or your bosses, you are working towards God. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, as I just want to explain a little bit about that. Ephesians chapter 2. And then I'm going to express something else as well. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. 
here these men, these satraps, the people, his own colleagues, were looking to try and find fault towards Daniel. Now listen to this. He was working with the Spirit of God in his heart and in his mind and in his life, but there was another spirit involved. And listen to verse of chapter 2, verse 2 of, the, of Ephesians. In which, okay, let's read verse 1, otherwise it doesn't make sense. As, you, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's a sinner. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You see, though Daniel was working with the power of, through the power of the Holy Spirit, there was another spirit working in his colleagues, the evil spirit. And they were following the evil spirit. And friends, we so easily, we so easily want to make, you know, make people happy. We so easily want people to approve us and accept us. And so we start living the way they do. And God's and the Spirit of God then says he's grieved. But this is how we should be doing. This would listen to what Paul when he speaks in chapter six of Ephesians. Turn there with me. Ephesians chapter six, verse five. It says, Slaves. Now you're not a slave, you're a, you're an employee. He says, employees. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Tough words for us, but this is the word of God. Obey them not only to win, uh, win their favor when, when their eyes are on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. And then he speaks to the masters, because they're not left out. And masters, bosses, treat your servants or slaves or employees in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he, was, he who, who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no favoritism with him. You see, friends, there's a, there's a lovely balance. Daniel did not work for Darius, though he did work for him. Daniel worked for God so that God may, God's name may be exalted. That's why Darius at the end of the chapter could say these wonderful words. Listen to these words again. I love them. He says, For he is the living God, and he endures forever. He is exalting God, a pagan king. Daniel didn't have to speak about the gospel. He is the gospel. He lived the gospel. Are we living the gospel? You see, 2 Timothy 2.15 says that Timothy presented himself to God as one approved. Daniel presented himself to God as one approved. A worker, listen to me, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. I ask you this morning, friend, are you that type of person that you can present yourself to God as a worker who cannot be, be ashamed and you are approved by God, not by men? Whoever's writing that text down, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. You see, Daniel impacted the life of Darius the, the Mede. But he also impacted the lives of his colleagues. You see, in verse 4, we see something very special. I want you to listen to me very carefully. At this point, the administrators and the satraps try to find grounds for charges against Daniel. Those are the lions. Not the lions in the, in the, in the pit where Daniel was going to get thrown into. These are the lions that walk around us that want to find fault with you. And friends, I ask you the question, if people go into your workplace, if they go to your desk, or they look in your files, or on your computer, what will they find? 
You see, listen to these words. At this, the, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could not find corruption in him because he was a trustworthy, because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Friends, for me, that's the gospel. That's the gospel in living, in, in, in living sight. That nobody could find fault with Daniel in his workplace. Because sometimes we hide stuff on our computers, on our cell phones, in our diaries. We use cryptic notes. And nothing was like that in front of Daniel in his life. Because he presented himself to God as one approved. I think as life becomes more realistic in the world that we're living in, friends, I think, you know, I, as a minister, I'm constantly aware of how frail and fragile life is. And sometimes you be, you, I've seen people living one day and they're gone the next. And you've got no time to hide the stuff away or clean up the areas that you, that where you're living and it's, dirt, and it's dirt. You know, clean that that part of my computer that's not, that is not kosher. Or hide those letters that aren't good. And then your family, as they clean up your, and they get rid of all your stuff when you pass on, I always think to myself, what would our children, when, they, when, we do, when we're gone, what, do they, what would they find? Hidden in the cupboards, hidden on our cell phones, hidden on our computers. I want to be a man who can present myself to God as one approved. Listen to what Paul says in Timothy. A worker, someone who works hard. When I look at the hands of people, I think to myself, your hands tell me so much about you, women and men. You can see hands that have worked hard, that have earned the living, honestly. But a worker whose hands are just lazy or soft and tender. I'm talking about mania. Because we try and slip and slide through life. We will be caught out with all this type of things. You see, the secret to this is the end of that verse of Timothy. He says, who correctly handles the word of truth. You see, friend, if you are spending time with God, if you are really sitting in his presence quietly on your own, not with your family, just on your own, and you listen to God's word as you read his word, listen to what Daniel did. In the first year of his reign, this is in Darius' time, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of God written, by Jeremiah. He sat in the presence of God and he could see the sign of the times. Friends, we must be able to see the sign of the times. He could see the sign of the times of Darius's reign and he knew that almost 70 years are over because God said 70 years from, Je from Jeremiah's word, the prophet Jeremiah, that Jeremiah said that Israel will be exiled for 70 years and Daniel was living in that 70 years and he knew the time was coming. Where God would rescue Israel. Are you aware of, 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 of God's return? Where he will rescue us from this chaos? Do you trust him? Do you believe that God is here for you and me? You see, Daniel could impact the lives of a king. He could impact the lives of the people around him. But friends, as, as Psalm 91 says, the arrow that comes by day, you cannot hear it coming to your heart, to strike you in your heart. The pestilence that, that hangs around like the COVID virus, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but it will come. The point is, where are you standing? You see, the psalmist says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. 
If your feet are firmly, fit, are firmly standing on the rock, Christ Jesus, the arrow that comes by day, which is shot by the lions, the figurative statement of those around you who are looking to devour you. If your feet aren't on the rock, you are on, ro- you are on sandy ground. One of the things about Daniel's life is that he was a diligent worker. The second part of Daniel's life is that he was a devout worshiper. I want you to look at verse 6 of Daniel chapter 6. The administrators and the satraps went as a group. Interesting word, a group, to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever normal words of somebody who just wants to patronize you. The royal administrators, the prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. What lies? I want you to learn to read your Bibles, friends. What lies? Because Daniel's not there, that doesn't mean everybody agrees. If you read the first verses of Daniel, chapter 6, you'll see Darius chose Daniel as part of a team. But they reckon all of us agree. We come as a group. But where's Daniel? You see, friends, when you're a Christian, you will be, you'll be led astray by the people that want to trip you up. And they will gang on you. But I want you to notice that Daniel doesn't argue. You don't hear anything about Daniel arguing or fretting. Psalm 37, I want to turn to, to Psalm 37. I want you to write this down. You don't have to turn there right now. Let me turn quickly. Listen to these words of Psalm 37. It says, do not fret. Do not rub your mind as the rubber of, 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 a, of a tire rubs against the, the tar of the road. That, 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 that pressure. Do not fret because of evil men. You see, friends, that's what we tend to do in the world that we're living in. We tend to fret when we see things going astray in our own lives. When we see evil people taking, trying to take over. And they're trying to step into the gaps where we need to go. When we know that we should be going. When there's a promotion and we, and we, and we think, well, that belongs to me. That position belongs to me. But how do you get that position? And then we start fretting. God says to us simply this, do not fret because of evil men. Or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. You say, but Lord, why don't you do it now straight away? Why do I have to wait? You see, Daniel gives us a lovely example. Be patient for the Lord. Be still and know that I am God. You know, an old friend of mine, a minister, in fact, my spiritual guide used to teach me on that particular text, be still and know that I'm God. He used to say to me, break it up into three parts and then meditate on each three parts. The first part is be still. You know, when things are going chaotic, it's difficult to be still. You see, even though I've kept quiet, people are saying, the camera is rolling. You've got to talk. You see, we've got to be still. Because when we're still, he's still working. And then you need to know. So it's the heart and in the mind. Know. What do you know about God? What you know, does it affect the heart? And when I know that he is who he claims to be, in control, then I don't fret. You see, the Bible tells me that he will be with me always. What can man do to me? If God is for me, who can be against me? Wonderful words for you and I as Christians in the world that we're living in today. The Bible says to us, do not fret. Do not be anxious. 
But listen to this. Trust in the Lord. Put it in another way. Throw yourself into his arms. Just throw yourself into his arms. Abandon yourself to God. Just lift up yourself and say, Lord, here I am. I remember when my son was young. I, uh, I, I was busy sitting. I was sitting at the edge of the bed tying my shoelaces. And he was behind me. I knew that he was behind me. And as I bent over, he ran behind me to j- jump onto my back. And I bent down at the same time and I felt him touching my, my, the back of my head. And I realized he's going to hit his head against the, the cupboard in front of us. And I instinctively just grabbed him. Poof, and I stopped him from hitting the ground, hitting the floor. And that just taught me about God. I need to run to him. Run, and then just dive at him. And, he'll, and he's, he grabs me. And he says, but that's what I want. I want to be your dad. I want to hold you tight. But I don't want to hold you there. I want to hold you here. That you can feel my heart. And my heart beat for you. He says, trust in me. Jesus said that as well. John chapter 14. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house. There's many rooms. Trust in God. And then he says, do good. Do good things. Let them see what you, who you are. Let them know that you are driven by a spirit. By a Holy Spirit. Living in you. I tell you all the time, friends. We have got the most blessed gift that anybody can give you. Nobody can give us a better gift than the Holy Spirit. But give your life to Him. Trust in Him. And then it says, dwell in the land. Daniel did that. He dwelt in the land. The land that God didn't give to them. It was a different land. It was a land in which God had allowed them to be exiled. But he dwelt in the land, even though the land was difficult, and the people were difficult, and their culture was difficult, because it wasn't a godly culture. But God said to him, dwell in the land, but trust in me. And then he says, enjoy safe pasture. You see, when we are walking with God and we're living in the presence of God, we will have good pasture. Not a good pastor, good pasture. And then he says this, delight yourself in the Lord. You see, friends, it's difficult when you're going through a rough time, when you're finding things are tough to delight delight yourself in the Lord. James tells us to, to enjoy hard times when troubles come. Just praise God. But it's difficult to clap your hands when you praise when you're going through a rough time. But there's something about us because joy is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit. And God gives us the ability to just feel this 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 wonderful presence in our hearts. That even though we're going through this hard, hard time, there's a quietness in the soul that says to us, I'm in control. Just rejoice. Rejoice. Delight yourself in the Lord. And then he does this. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Daniel understood this because he was a worshiper of God. I want you to turn back with me to to Daniel chapter 6. Listen to these words as we read verse 7. The royal administrators, the prefects, and the the whole story have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. An edict, a decree written by the Persian king or the Medo-Persian king was something that couldn't be revoked. He couldn't even revoke it himself. If he, if he signed the decree, it was written, it's made in stone. And so they fed the king's ego. And he doesn't think it through. And friends, sometimes we get people like that, when they find a group of people coming in and giving them a whole lot of information and proposals, you feel threatened as a leader. Or they might just 
you know, coat it with a bit of sugar and say to you, but king, you know, you are the, you're going to live forever. Your company is going to be going. It's going to be growing. But we need to do this. We need to put this in place. Because you are, the, you are a visionary king. And then you just signs. So in verse 8, it's, he does that. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it into writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So the king Darius put the put the decree in, in writing. Now this is where I want to share with you that Daniel was a man of worship. He was a, a sincere worshipper. He says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home. What do you do when you find that there's a, a notice spread out into your company and certain things were, are mentioned and you weren't even involved in the discussion and you're supposed to be there because you're a manager. And it doesn't seem to be right because you see loopholes. Where do you go? Sometimes we go to our wives. Sometimes we go to our chummies and we can sit in the coffee bar and we say, yes, like that guy. You know, what type of business am I in? The company doesn't care. I've given myself to this company. They just don't understand me. You don't go home. But listen to what the word says. Verse 10. Daniel went home to his upstairs room where the windows were opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed. See friends, Daniel didn't start panicking. That's what I found out when the COVID virus came through. I just heard panic. People running all over the place, sending messages of, of this scripture and that scripture, and there was panic. Very few of us went home to pray. But not only just go home to pray. It was, Daniel could have gone home to pray and cry and whatever. But listen to, the, listen to the verse. It says, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed. Three times a day. Giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Daniel continued doing what he was doing in the midst of chaos. He just continued trusting in God. You see, there was, a, there, was a, some, there was something going here. The decree said for 30 days you must just pray to, to Darius and no other God. Daniel could have said, well, that's not too bad. For 30 days, it's not a long time. I can just pray to Darius. God understands the situation. He understands. He won't, he won't get upset with me. It doesn't seem so bad 30 days. What's 30 days? But Daniel was a man of integrity. Daniel was a godly man. And nothing stood in front of his God. Not even, not even, the, not even the, the, the threat of danger. Daniel went home. And probably if it was in the morning, he went home for that particular morning because he did it always. He spent time with God in the morning. Then he would go back to work. And he'd work diligently. Then come back in the afternoon and pray to his God. With the windows open, not to show people publicly what he was doing, but there's a symbol there, a sign of saying, Lord, my windows are open of my heart. Please hear my heart. He's done it all the time. He's 70 years old. People know how Daniel lives. People have seen how Daniel lives. He's not a hidden Christian. His life is open to the world. Transparent. Accountable. That's what we should be doing. Daniel wasn't afraid of people, but he was afraid of his God. And he kept on going every single day. And he prayed. Now I want you to notice, friends, he falls down on his knees and prays. And it says here, he prayed giving thanks. So he spoke to God. He had this relationship with God. And I'm going to say this to you, friends, that we need to develop a relationship with God that, is a, that allows us to speak to him, not in theological terms. Because that's what prevents us from speaking to God. Because we think, well, Lord, I haven't got the language that the pastor has. Because he speaks like a spiritual language. God just wants you to, have a communi to communicate with him from your heart. 
and make time available. You know, we often think of the Muslim folk who, who close their shops at a certain time on a Friday. And you can, you can rock up at the shop and you want to buy something that's important and the door's closed because it says they've gone to, the, gone to their temple. And you wait. And I always say this to Christians, why don't we do the same? We've got the living God. And we cannot even do the same. Why can we not tell our bosses, I have a time of prayer. And you need, to, you need to acknowledge that. Or you need to respect that. I had a time when I was busy studying to be a minister. And I took my lunch time. It was an hour where I could study. Because I had to write, write certain assignments. And I did some research. And I found a little room where I could take my books out on the table. And, and I closed the door. And I would do some studying. And one day my boss rushed in. He never knocked on the door. He just rushed in because he thought, what is Wayne doing? And when, I, when he opened the door, he, I looked up from my books. And his eyes were as big as saucers. And he said, sorry. And he slipped out. And it taught me a lesson. It taught him a lesson, I hope. But it taught me a lesson never to be afraid of my God. Paul says it in these wonderful words. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto the salvation of the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Friends, I say this to you. God is a living God. And our lives are a living testimony. Daniel in, ver in, chapter, in verse 10 of chapter 6, he prays and gives thanks. And listen to what Paul says. He says this in, in Philippians 4 verse 6. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, he says. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Daniel lives this text. He's gentle. There's no sign of Daniel throwing his toys out the cot, making his name known. I want you to, I want to, I want you to listen to this. A, a prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. He says, where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I, am, I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. That's the spirit that Daniel had. To be understood as to understand. To love as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Daniel lived the text. He says his gentleness is everywhere, is evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. That's what Daniel did. He said, I gave thanks to God. He says, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. If you're writing those down. Daniel was able to... Pray constantly to God. As he learnt of the information. And then he says this. In verse 11. These men went to as a group to find Daniel. Praying and asking God for help. You see the devil is always waiting. I thought, Think about this for a second. Think about it. Daniel, just be the fly on the wall. Daniel's on his knees. Searching God's heart, thanking God, praising God, pleading with God, saying, Lord, this is the situation, but you my God. Folk, walk, walk with me here. Just join me in this position. And then as he's praying, there's a sense of the presence of God with him. But just outside that, that, that space is, are men who are looking to accuse him 
Accusing. Accusing. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. There's always someone to accuse you, trying to accuse you. But they will not penetrate the presence of the God in your life. Daniel was not deeply disturbed by that. I'm sure he must have heard the noise. He must have smelt the fragrance of their presence. But he preferred to experience the presence of God and the fragrance of the beauty of God. Verse 11 says, Then these men went as a group. And then they went to the king, verse 12, and spoke to him about the decree. And they, and they, said, and they reminded the king. Interesting that they reminded the king. They were so determined to break Daniel down. And they asked him, Did you, did you remember? And then they said to him, Let's read the scriptures. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. They were aware of what he did. And then listen to verse 14. And the king heard this. Listen to these words. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. And if you stopped there, you'd miss the story. He was determined to rescue Daniel and make every effort until sundown to save him. This is where I want to use my last point. He was a determined witness, Daniel. He was a determined witness. Daniel, in this whole process, never argues, never defends himself. Daniel was always the second person in the story. No matter where Daniel stood, he bore witness to God Almighty. Even in the corridors of power, kings knew that Daniel's God was the, most, was the Almighty. Even in the chambers of ordinary people, they knew who his God was. I ask you this morning, friends, do people, know, people around you know well, who God, which God you serve? Yeah, we see Daniel as a a determined witness because even the king is willing to save Daniel. I'm going to put it into your terms and my terms. Would your boss do everything that they can to keep you in the position that you're in? Because they see a diligent worker and they, dis- and they see someone who is as I said earlier, a devout worshipper? Can they see someone who worships God and because you are, your presence is there, you make everything prosper? Listen to what, he, what, what Darius says. May you prosper greatly. He talks to his, to, his, to his nation, to his people. May you prosper greatly. Why? Because you are there. You're the person that's there and God is blessing you. And because God is blessing you, God blesses the company. God blesses the nation. What does 2 Chronicles 2.14 say? I want you to read that passage to yourself and I want you to pray about it. Because I believe that what God is saying to us, if we, if we want to be determined witnesses, that people will see us and follow us and that when they look at us, they know that Jesus is with us, God is with us, and God's favor is upon us. And when, they, when they're working with us, they know that they will be blessed. And because of our lives, people will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. You see, yeah, the text shows me When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He can be distressed over many things, but he was distressed about Daniel's safety. And then listen to the story. 
Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that the according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. This is for the little children. Do you hear Daniel screaming and kicking and holding tight on the door frames? No. The king said to Daniel, Listen to these words, little ladies. May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. You see, when it's out of his hands, when he can't sort things out, you have to leave it to God. Does that make sense to you? When things are out of your control, when things are out of your control or even not even the control of your bosses, you give it into the Lord's hands. And they will say in their own hearts, May your God save you. May your God save you. That's his last hope. Daniel just looks at him. Have you ever seen someone who just patiently knows that he's, there, there's danger in, 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 ahead of him, but he looks with, at you with, in those, with those eyes of courage, of peace? You can put me into any situation. As the Shadrach, Meshach, and Begnigo said, if we have to face the fiery furnace, so be it, our Lord will help. If not, we'll still worship Him. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I wish it was me. I wish I could say that. But when someone as a pagan says to you, may your God, whom you serve, continually save you, not just once, not just twice, but many. Friends, that's the God we serve. He's a living God. And so they rolled the stone in front, of the, in front of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his, of his nobles. He had to do it as formality. So Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace. Now listen to this. And spent the night without eating. In other words, he fasted <laughs> for, this poor, for this poor young man called, well, not young, he's an older man, Daniel, who loved God. He's impacted the lives of someone. In other words, he's saying, here I stand. Remember I said that? Here I stand. Behind me, around me are the lions. Up there are the lions. They all want to devour me, but here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Friends, this is the faith that we're supposed to be worship, supposed to be following and proclaiming. And the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. If someone worries about you so much, you must know you're worth it. I ask you this morning, do people look at you like that? Will people go to the extent for you like that? That they won't even sleep when they know that you are in trouble. Think about what I'm saying. How many people do you know that know your life so well that when they hear that you're in trouble, they will not rest and they will fast for you. And they're not Christian. Verse 19 says, at, first, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called out to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel! Servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Silence. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions up there and here. They have not hurt me. They've not hurt me. Why? 
Why Daniel? Because I am a servant of the Most High God. And I love my Savior. And my Savior loves me. And He will always be with me. The Lord is my helper. Listen to these words from Hebrews. The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Folk, for me, this is such a powerful piece of scripture. They have not hurt me because I was found, listen to these words, innocent in God's sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O King. This is a wonderful man, a determined witness, a devout worshipper, and a diligent, diligent worker. He was able to say, Yeah, I stand. That even the king could say, for he is the living God. I pray that people, when they look at us as Christians, they would also say, those people serve the living God and I want them to work for me because I can trust them. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, I thank you for the wonderful privilege of being able to say that I serve a living God who lives in my heart and I can trust him in every situation of my life. I pray, Lord, this morning that as I stand here, I've given some, some insight into your word that will help your people in the situations that they are facing right now. I pray, Father, that each one of us will be able to say, here I stand. God is my witness. I worship Him in every circumstance that I face because I know that He's in control. And Father God, I pray this morning that we would grow stronger in, your, in the knowledge of You and that, Father, whatever situations that we face, we may be able to say, Lord, I'm innocent before you and I've done nothing wrong to my neighbor because I've lived short accounts with both my neighbor and with you. And I know that your, your hand is of favors upon me. So Father, allow us to just think about these things this, this week and bring Glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you. Thank you. We apologize for the sound. It's a problem with dealing with batteries, unfortunately. <laughs> Would you stand with us? We're going we're gonna to sing. I pray that God has challenged you with this, this message. I know that he's definitely challenged me. I know that he's challenged me, and I pray that he's challenged your heart this morning. And taken, taken something that might have been a bit of a, a neglectful thought and put it on your heart to, to attend to throughout this week. So I pray that God would look after you and that he'd build his kingdom in your heart.
in our hearts again Increase in us we pray Unveil while we may Come set our hearts ablaze Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come invade us now